There are many kings in Kangen. You got the king of slaughter, the king of brutality, the fist breaking king, the king of Hades, the conquering king, and the king of jobbers. Although they are all considered kings by name, their rule was short-lived, their legacy forgotten, and their removal from power embarrassing. Kings in Kengen are not gifted with longevity. Therefore, the true mark of a king is in the final moments of his rule, the moment where his authority is doomed, where no policy can save him from the cruel embrace of defeat. Faced with the seemingly insurmountable wall before him, he continues to fight till the bitter end. Then, and only then, will he solidify for himself a blaze of glory that will burn until he is defeated. Welcome to my channel, you can call me Maz. Of all the kings in Kengen, two stand out from the rest. Roland Donire, the king of purgatory and advocate for domestic violence, and Kano Ajito, the king of the Kengen matches and the father of all bakeries. In this video, I will be diverting from my usual song and dance by dedicating a single video to a single matchup. Why? Because I feel inspired. Inspired to totally examine this matchup on a narrative level, a physical level, and a technical level to determine who has better odds of defeating the other. So, can the King of Purgatory force the Usurper to atone for the sin of challenging him? Or will the King of the Kingan matches show Roland just how big the world really is? It's time to find out. It is quite easy to write Roland off as a one-dimensional, boring character with ham-fisted and artificially manufactured build-up that appeals to the lowest common denominator. But his interactions with other characters beg to differ. Throughout the Kengen vs Purgatory tournament, Roland has often taken the role of a narrator in order to supply information behind Purgatory's fighters. For instance, during Zeroda's fight with Hayami, Roland is responsible for illustrating the efficacy of the swing by indicating how it revolutionizes the throw by eliminating the period of vulnerability between the grab and the throw itself. Later on, during Nicholas's mats with Akoya, Roland objects to Leo's comparison between Nicholas and Yumigahama to illustrate how Sahat is specifically designed for Nicholas due to his above average reach as well as his reflexes. These two portrayals of Roland not only serve to provide readers valuable information on both Zeroda and Nicholas, but it illustrates Roland's vast knowledge on the fighters under his jurisdiction, giving him undeniable weight behind his statements because they possess credibility. Although I can analyze all of Roland's statements, they ultimately serve to corroborate his philosophy toward fighting, that people who know how to use what little they have in a very skillful fashion are more dangerous than those who use their immense power in a less skilled manner. So, in regard to this matchup, the best way to look at Roland's statements towards Ajito is through the lens of his philosophy. The first moment where Roland directly addresses Ajito is when Julius Reinhold stepped up during the third round of the tournament. Roland states that he views both Wakasuki and Ajito as two top-level fighters who both have the potential to be defeated by Julius, with Wakasuki being second to Ajito when it comes to power. Although the meaning of the term power in this context is incredibly loose and could either be referring to combat prowess 
or sheer physical strength. Regardless, Roland believes Ajito's power is superior to Wakasuki, a fighter who possesses Herculean might and is regarded as possessing the most powerful strikes in the world, showcasing a very high estimation for Ajito's quote-unquote power. Furthermore, during Ajito's fight with Lutian, Roland compliments Ajito, stating that his position as king of the Kengen matches is justified after seeing him overcome Lutian's technique with swift and deliberate attacks, not only implying Lutian's merits as one of the three demon fists, but illustrating Roland's acknowledgement of Ajito's skill as a fighter. Through these two moments in the series, we as readers are presented with how Roland views Ajito within the scope of his own philosophy. He believes Ajito has more power than Wakasuki and enough skill to warrant his respect. Therefore, in accordance with his belief surrounding martial arts, Ajito would be a fighter with immense power and the skill to use it, signifying what Roland at the very least, would consider a threat. This is the primary reason why I do not consider Tokuno Tokumichi's statement to be much of a valid argument due, in small part, to Roland's open endorsement of the Fang of Mitsudo. On the other hand, Ajito is particularly tight-lipped, but after overhearing Roland's list of accomplishments, including an unparalleled win record of 422 straight victories and fighting Kuroki to a draw, Ajito acknowledges Roland's power by simply saying that he is immensely strong, being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a foe that gave him the most devastating defeat of his life. Furthermore, Ajito is the first to identify that Roland was using pre-initiative to overcome Oma's pre-initiative, an ability that has been described as the ultimate power, a technique that separates the strong from the weak, a power that places people in a class of their own, a state that is worthy of praise from those who are the strongest. Ajito is a fighter who is well aware of this precedent because he acknowledges how abilities like pre have helped him to evolve, have enabled him to exceed himself, and have helped him grow stronger. Therefore, Seeing Roland exhibit a rather impressive level of this ultimate power against a fighter who has reached that same state is deserving of Ajito's respect because this is a level of refinement that less than a handful of fighters have attained. So though it be implied, Ajito should view Roland as not only immensely powerful, but immensely skilled. Although the narrative does not indicate a clear victor out of the two kings, it reinforces one simple fact, that both of them will struggle to defeat their opponent. So indicating a clear victor would be completely blasphemous, and would ignore the perspectives that these two characters share of each other. But if we want to get closer to a definitive answer that respects the narrative between these kings, we will have to visit the wonderful world of power scaling. Power scaling is the most important tool used for deciding the outcome of a matchup. Although fights, especially in Kengen, are decided by factors outside of a character's physical abilities and limitations, the combatant who is faster, stronger, and more durable will still have a distinct advantage over one who is slower, weaker, and less durable. Therefore, this is a very efficient way to determine who would win. So, to come to a more definitive answer, we will be examining the physical abilities and limitations of both kings, starting with Roland. In terms of power, Roland is very hard to determine. Although he possesses enough power to knock out Toei Mudo, he does so despite being inferior in every physical attribute including offensive power. Furthermore, despite demonstrating the power to damage Toei, Roland's strikes couldn't penetrate past Oma's indestructible, 
a technique that the likes of Wakasuki overcame very easily. A fighter who was evenly matched with Zulius in terms of raw strength, with Zulius being evenly matched with Toei in the same manner. Therefore, Roland's power doesn't make sense because if he has the firepower to knock out Toei, then he should be able to overcome Oma's indestructible fairly easily. But there are quite a few factors at play here that are influencing Roland's inconsistent sewings. One, Roland landed a body sought, reducing the amount of power necessary to damage Toei by harming a vulnerable region of his body. Two, Roland diverted Toei's punts by performing a parry, a technique with Ensilop that is performed with elbows, which redirects blows and takes fighters off balance. According to Tokido Niko, taking opponents off balance provides a good opening for strikes, most likely giving Roland an even better means of transmitting his power. Three, Roland is a practitioner of Seelot, a martial art that involves striking outside the opponent's awareness by taking advantage of the size difference between a larger opponent and a smaller opponent, reducing Toei's ability to endure Roland's blows by preventing him from defending in a timely manner. 4. Pre-initiative By throwing strikes preemptively, pre-initiative users can overcome most techniques by throwing their strikes before their opponent has time to react, providing further leverage against Toei by practically ignoring his style of martial arts altogether and providing him little chance of endearing Roland's blows. Through these four factors which serve to eliminate Toei's chances of preparing for incoming blows while amplifying his own power, Roland is capable of defeating the Beast of Destruction with the power that he does possess. However, due to the nature of his victory, more so revolving on his skills as a fighter rather than his raw power, and the fact that Roland didn't overcome Oma's indestructible with said power, leads me to believe that in terms of this attribute, Roland is inferior to the likes of Wakasuki, Toei, and Zulius. Which makes sense, considering how Roland is inferior in every physical attribute when compared to Toei, along with his portrayal as an all-rounder who doesn't focus on zest power. In terms of movement speed, Roland is stated to possess agility that is on a whole other level, a statement that was exemplified when he overcame Yamasita's fist eye with Kazo remarking how he could not see his moves coming, illustrating how Roland is not only as fast as Kyuzan's raging vigor, but also round to advance Oma and Curry Rayan in his removal state, with Yamashita stating how Kyuzan vanished before his eyes, or how Oma and Rayan were simply too fast. In terms of striking speed, Roland was able to impress Gao Lang, who states that the speed of his strikes might be on par with his signature technique, Flash. Although Roland may not be as fast as Gao Lang, that is still pretty remarkable when you consider all the other things he is capable of doing. In terms of durability, the amount of power that can be withstood without taking any damage, Roland was unable to fully withstand Oma's Ironbreaker. So, Roland is essentially less durable than Rayan, who took multiple Iron Breakers before showing signs of damage, and Wakasuki, who completely ignored an Iron Breaker kick. However, when it comes to endurance, the amount of damage that can be taken without getting knocked out, Roland is capable of enduring a punch and a change of scenery from a fully unleashed advance Oma, an output of the advance that enabled him to square up on equal footing against Rayan an individual placed in the same league with Julius and Wakasuki when it comes to raw strength. So while Roland cannot ignore blows from Oma, he can withstand a fair amount of punishment. Now onto Ajito. In terms of power, Ajito has demonstrated enough raw power to bend Wakasuki's ankle. Wakasuki, who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Julius for a brief period of time, 
who possesses more power behind his blows than Curry Rayan and can overcome Oma's indestructible through sheer physical strength. However, Ajito's power was most likely influenced by Wakasuki's weakness to Formless. Furthermore, Wakasuki says that none of his defeats were determined by a gap in physical strength, implying that Ajito relied upon his skills as a fighter rather than his raw power to best him. So, despite this in itself being an irrefutable physical achievement, it's a testament to the power that Ajito can achieve when exclusively using locking techniques. After all, grappling techniques enable fighters to use their power to its fullest extent. So, Ajito has enough power to directly injure the likes of Wakasuki, who is in the league with Julius and Toei. Therefore, placing Ajito in a similar league when it comes to power, with the power of his strikes being lower than the power of his grappling techniques. In terms of striking speed, Ajito was completely overwhelmed by Gaolang and was forced to apply different strategies all together to overcome the gap in striking speed. So, in this regard, Ajito is inferior to Gaolang and other characters who exceed him, like Carlos. In terms of movement speed, Ajito is relative to both Okubo and Hatsumi, being able to land blows on them as they retreat, making Ajito quite slow when you consider characters like Kyozan and Mikazuchi, who both outstrip Ajito in this regard. In terms of durability, the amount of power that can be withstood without taking any damage, Ajito failed to fully withstand strikes from Okubo, who drew blood from him, strikes from Gaolang, which were able to crack his bones and place Ajito in a situation where he could break down at any moment, and Kuroki's Devil Lance, which successfully stabbed him on two occasions. So despite being in a similar league with Wakasuki, Ajito isn't capable of ignoring a whole lot of blows. However, in terms of endurance, the amount of damage that can be taken without getting knocked out, Ajito endured all of Okubo's strikes, endured all of Gaolang's strikes, and even a completely one-sided beatdown from Kuroki, where he struck Ajito from outside of his awareness, preventing Ajito from defending in any significant manner. So while Ajito is not impervious to blows from characters like Gaolang or Kuroki, he can go quite the distance. Now that we have a rough estimation for the physical capabilities of both kings, we can now have a better understanding of how they stack up against each other. First and foremost, Roland possesses a sizable speed advantage compared to Ajito, with his movements being capable of overcoming the fist eye and his striking speed being somewhat comparable to Gaolang's striking speed something which Ajito couldn't handle very well. However, on the flip side, there exists a gap in power between Roland and Ajito, with Ajito being in a similar league with the likes of Wakasuki, Toei, and Julius, while Roland isn't. But with that being the case, these differences will hardly influence the outcome of this match. After all, Differences in speed can be overcome with certain techniques, differences in power can be overturned with different skills, and endurance can be compromised in a multitude of ways. So, what I'm saying is that a match like this will ultimately come down to whose techniques are more effective. So, let's discuss the final aspect that will provide us a more concrete conclusion, that being Technical skill. Technical skill comes in many forms, usually involving the execution of techniques that range from basic and mundane to high level and complicated. However, the effectiveness of such techniques is ultimately determined by the user and the strategies that they employ to defeat their opponent. After all, Martial arts is simply a crutch, 
It makes people more accustomed to fighting by providing practical techniques and forms that can be used to defeat someone. However, if fighters want to make the most of what they have learned, they must make decisions on their own and come up with strategies in the midst of combat. So while techniques enable people to learn the basics from A to Z, strategies are what enable fighters to go beyond the alphabet and survive in situations where they are outclassed. Considering the differences in physical ability between our two kings, a discussion surrounding their individual strategies will be necessary. But to really contextualize their tactics, we will have to discuss their techniques and the nature of their styles. Starting with Roland. Roland is a practitioner of Seelot, a soft martial art with hundreds of unique variations, all of which involve extremely close quarters combat and is based around striking. The range at which Seelot operates is the shortest of almost all martial arts, a range which significantly reduces the amount of options that fighters have at their disposal besides short range to point blank techniques. Furthermore, fighting in such conditions requires a great deal of precision, most likely because there is very little room for generating power. Forcing practitioners to remove all the waste in their movements to master all the power that they have. Due to the need for precision and to refine one's power, Seelot is best suited for the less physically robust because smaller, less powerful fighters can conduct themselves far better at shorter distances and serve to benefit the most from reducing wasted movements. These qualities give Seelot practitioners the opportunity to take advantage of the technical blind spot of other fighters who are not used to fighting at such close trains or those who require more of it due to their size. This advantage is further compounded by the variety of short range techniques like spinning elbows for more power, 12-6 elbows to strike from above, and elbow uppercuts to strike from below. Furthermore, regular elbows are not only used for attacking, but are used for defensive purposes to block, parry, redirect, and avoid blows while simultaneously taking opponents off balance, providing them ample opportunity to strike vulnerable regions of the body and amplify their power. In short, Seelot is, by design, a giant killing martial art that enables the weak to turn their weakness into an advantage. Since mastering Seelot, Roland has branched out considerably to better suit his style of constant aggression with little investment toward passivity. As such, he has adopted various different forms to constantly stay on the offense. For example, by throwing punches with the rotation of his shoulder blades, Roland can keep his core steady while improving his torque, enabling him to increase his striking speed at the cost of power because he no longer incorporates the force generated by other parts of his body. On the flip side, Roland can incorporate his shoulder blade into his straights, improving his reach by extending his arms and increasing his power by using the force generated from more regions of the body, all at the cost of speed. Through these two different forms, Roland can continue to assault his opponent by using different stances depending on the situation. However, a style that sacrifices all defensive capabilities for offensive power would never be complete without a finishing move. So, Roland devised the invisible elbow, an elbow that is thrown from outside the opponent's awareness. Although this finishing move is particularly uninspired, it serves as another layer of amplification by enabling Roland to take his opponent by surprise if they manage to overcome the technical blind spot in close quarters. So this is more like a failsafe than it is a climactic finisher. On the topic of failsafes, if Roland's ability to fight in close quarters is compromised, 
he can bridge the short range gap and make direct contact through grappling techniques. For example, Roland can strike acupuncture points in order to control his opponent's movements by using their sense of pain against him, enabling him to perform sufficient takedowns where he can then perform locking techniques and other short range strikes to end the match as quickly as possible, providing Roland options in cases where his opponent can overcome him in close quarters. Against most opponents, however, Roland will never have to resort to such solutions because of a certain skill that gives him complete and utter control over a match. Initially developed by the practitioners of the Kaiwan style to combat armed opponents, pre-initiative is the highest form of foresight that involves discerning the moment the opponent is about to attack essentially predicting the opponent's next move, and moving immediately before them, using reflexes to launch an attack before they attack. Besides enabling fighters to strike what they cannot see, this technique enables them to counter movements before they even begin, dodge attacks before they start, and exceed expectations. In short, pre-initiative is a technique used to overcome technique. However, Roland's pre-initiative is on another level. Considering how fights between two pre-initiative users are ultimately determined by whose pre-initiative is better, the fighter who can predict the furthest will succeed in making the first blow. So, by overcoming Oma's pre-initiative, a skill that he mastered by successfully using it to dodge Roland's strikes before they were launched, Roland has demonstrated the ability to predict multiple moves ahead, an indicator of superior pre-initiative. Furthermore, considering his mastery of Seelot, a style that involves great precision and a small set of specialized moves, his pre-initiative would be greater because his reflexes aren't dampened by a vast arsenal of options. But pre-initiative isn't the end-all be-all. After all, the more complicated a match becomes, the more small changes can have a larger impact because it can cause ripples that disrupt a fighter's prediction. That is why Roland had such difficulty dealing with Oma's minuscule bursts of the possessing spirit because it disrupted his predictions by the slightest margin, stopping him from preemptively checking Oma's movements and techniques. Although Roland is by all rights considered an all-rounder who can adapt to any situation by using different techniques when it is most beneficial, this level of specialization would also make Roland a flawless spear, a fighter who has perfected his path to the utmost degree. So, in regards to Roland's fighting style, he has struck a unilateral relationship between adaptation and specialization, with his ability to adapt more so serving as a crutch in unfavorable conditions, while his specialization, his mastery of sealot, pre-initiative, and use of offensive forms, often taking center stage. Now, on to Ajito. Ajito is a practitioner of formless a martial art centered around both flexibility and unpredictability. The formless style's greatest weapon of flexibility is provided by its vast arsenal of techniques, ranging from long range to close range strikes and grappling techniques like throws, locks, and holds, ensuring that formless practitioners possess a viable number of techniques in any given situation and can switch between different strategies when one of them doesn't work. However, this vast arsenal forces formless practitioners to take time to pick and choose each move, creating a slight delay that gives the opponent an opening to attack. But this weakness is somewhat accounted for when considering the formless style's unpredictability. True fluid and flexible motions Practitioners of Formless can remove the form behind their techniques, serving not only to enable them to slip out of precarious positions, but makes their movements harder to comprehend, 
enabling practitioners of formless to become the natural enemy of foresight. This lack of form provides some protection against the weaknesses of the formless style. For example, by removing all form to stall the opponent's reactions and disrupt predictions, it should provide enough time for formless practitioners to choose their next move by intentionally delaying the opponent. Furthermore, it provides enough time for practitioners to adapt, usually in the sense of finding the right timing to execute techniques. Even so, a specialist can still get the upper hand if they specialize in a single move and are faster than their opponent. This weakness is compounded even further when considering that reflexes drop relative to stamina, meaning that the longer a match continues and the more damage that is accumulated, it will take longer and longer for formless practitioners to spend time picking their next move thanks to their deteriorating physical condition, providing even more leverage to specialists who can cope better because they spend less time picking. So although this style of combat is definitely effective in certain circumstances, formless comes with major drawbacks. To ultimately bridge this weakness, along with solving his dependence on formless, Ajito created martial arts, a style that emulates the principles of traditional martial arts by drastically limiting the number of options to improve reflexes. The practicality of Ajito's new style is attributed by its use of techniques fused together from various martial arts. Techniques ranging from a variety of kicks that can be executed in long to super long reigns, traditional punching techniques at mid reigns, a variety of elbows at short reigns, and Ajito's signature technique, the Dragon Sot, a blow that can be thrown at point blank with minimal motion and minimal reins. It is the strongest technique in Ajito's possession. Thanks to this limited move pool, which ensures that he doesn't have any blind spots at any reins, Ajito spends less time picking and choosing, enabling him to maximize his reflexes to its fullest extent, execute techniques better, and chain them together into efficient combinations. Transforming Ajito from a well-rounded, unconventional fighter into an exceptional specialist. Furthermore, the reflexes provided by a smaller move pool have enabled Ajito to enhance his foresight, giving him access to pre-initiative. Much like other characters who have obtained this ultimate power, Ajito can counter movements before they even begin, dodge attacks before they start, and exceed expectations enabling him to overcome technique. However, despite sharpening his reflexes, his ability to make predictions is not as refined, and when considering the fact that the fighter who can predict the furthest will succeed in making the first blow, Ajito possesses inferior pre-initiative, especially when compared to Kuroki, where he initially won the contest of predictions against Ajito. Furthermore, like all pre-initiative, small, minuscule changes can disrupt Ajito's predictions, stalling his reactions and giving his opponent a chance to attack. Considering these drawbacks, much like Formless, Martial Arts is also a double-edged blade that makes Ajito stronger in some aspects, but weaker in others. When compared to Roland's style of combat, Ajito has achieved a far greater balance. With Formless, Ajito possesses both the flexibility and the adaptation of an all-rounder, along with unpredictable motions that are alien to traditional martial arts. And with martial arts, Ajito possesses both the speed and precision of a specialist, along with the apex of foresight that renders technique futile. This 50-50 relationship between formless and martial arts enables Ajito to account for the weaknesses of either style while maintaining a balance between adaptation and specialization. 
However, this prevents Ajito from reaching new levels of mastery with either formless or martial arts, preventing him from besting fighters who have completely mastered their respective techniques and styles. Now that we have analyzed their unique technical skills, we can now take a glimpse at the strategies they have used, starting with Roland. As his style and techniques suggest, Roland's primary strategy is to use his foresight to seal away his opponent's movements and force them onto his home turf where he ultimately has the advantage. A similar strategy was used by Gaolang to seal away Ajito's kicks and grappling techniques while limiting his opponent's options to only mid-range punching combinations, a range at which Gaolang excelled. So, much like Gaolang's strategy, it enabled Roland to play to his strengths by using his foresight to check all movements besides close range techniques, providing him further leverage to defeat his opponent. However, such a strategy heavily relies on his foresight, and if his opponent can manage to disrupt it, the strategy will fall apart. Therefore, in response to opponents who are capable of outmaneuvering his foresight, Roland used another strategy that involves completely abandoning close quarters combat by grappling his opponent, limiting their movements while enabling Roland to pummel them. The only time Roland has ever used this strategy was when he was no longer capable of containing Oma in close quarters because he was speeding up in bursts with the possessing spirit, disrupting his foresight by the slightest margin and preventing him from sealing Oma's options to only close quarters. So, to prevent Oma from stealing the initiative, Roland used this strategy to limit Oma's use of the possessing spirit by nullifying his mobility, enabling Roland to overcome Oma's strategy while giving him enough time to adapt to it. Now, on to Ajito. Ajito is best known for his evolution a strategy that involves using the adaptability and flexibility present in the formless style to create a new system of martial arts best suited for defeating his opponent. This strategy was used against Gaolang to curb his boxing along with his strategy of sealing Ajito's techniques. Although it comes with the drawback of requiring time to adapt, it enables Ajito to directly counter his opponent's techniques and strategies to bring the match to an end, emulate the strategies used by other fighters, and to render those same strategies and techniques futile. When using the techniques of martial arts, Ajito uses his foresight to limit his opponent's movements to provide himself an advantage. For example, against Hatsumi. Ajito used various long range to mid range techniques to drive Hatsumi's guard lower and lower to ensure that his follow up kick would land by making Hatsumi's next move more predictable. However, Hatsumi is able to dodge the kick by exceeding Ajito's expectations by sifting his knee. Furthermore, Ajito performed an unfeasible kick while in a joint lock, limiting all of Hatsumi's options except his signature triple strike combination, setting up a finger lock that ultimately turned the fight in his favor. After gaining the initiative, Ajito uses a variety of short range to mid range techniques to push Hatsumi into the long range, a range in which his kicks are more likely to land. So, much like the strategies used by both Gaolang and Roland, Ajito is capable of doing just about the same thing. Ajito possesses one more strategy that involves switching between formless and martial arts to exceed his opponent's expectations. This was used against Kuroki to disrupt his foresight and ruin the timing of his techniques. However, 
like all strategies that revolve around switching between two different techniques or styles of combat, the period in between the switch leaves fighters vulnerable, especially in the case with Ajito, where his two styles are unleashed with two separate personas, generating a great deal of lag. So, fighters who can ascertain the timing or simply adapt to it can take advantage of such an opportunity to defeat Ajito, a weakness that can be compounded even further by any number of blind spots and strikes to vulnerable regions of the body. However, Ajito has since eliminated this weakness by integrating both of his personalities, reducing the lag by a couple of milliseconds, a slight adjustment that, according to Kuroki, makes all the difference in the world. The power of Ajito's improved strategy was best demonstrated in his match with Lutian, where Ajito was able to steal the match entirely, despite being outmatched completely in terms of technical skill. With Lutian overcoming both the techniques of formless and martial arts, while being compared to a flawless spear. Illustrating how Ajito's new and improved strategy can be used to go beyond the alphabet, enabling Ajito to succeed in situations where he is outclassed. But this does not mean that it is invincible, as it can still be influenced by factors that work to delay Ajito's reflexes, like blind spots, strikes to vulnerable regions of the body, and, well, exhaustion. Now that we have analyzed their styles, techniques, and strategies, we can determine which of our two kings has the technical advantage. Despite Ajito's proficiency with two styles that provide him both adaptability and practicality, Roland possesses the technical edge. Although Ajito's formless will undoubtedly disrupt Roland's reflexes and foresight through unpredictable motions and the lack of form, the speed that Roland can achieve through one of his offensive forms comes close to Gao Lang's striking speed. Strikes which are fast enough to exploit the major weakness of Ajito's formless. Therefore, Roland should be able to overcome formless by exploiting the consequences of its vast move pool. Unfortunately, martial arts Ajito doesn't fare much better. Although Ajito's much smaller move pool enables him to cope better in close quarters by improving his reflexes, precision, and foresight, Roland is more experienced in close quarters combat, possesses far more precision thanks to his mastery of sea lot, and his pre initiative is much sharper than Ajito's. Meaning, Roland would most likely have a much easier time overcoming the techniques of martial arts than formless. After all, it is his origin. However, this match between kings takes a sharp turn when considering their strategies. Roland can overcome Ajito's evolution strategy by taking advantage of the time necessary for him to adapt and he can easily overcome Ajito's ceiling strategy by using his far superior foresight to limit his moves. However, Roland has no answer and no means of exploiting Ajito's switching strategy, something which would prevent Roland from sealing Ajito's options by enabling Ajito to exceed Roland's expectations. Meaning, that Ajito is capable of compromising Roland's foresight, which will prevent him from fighting in close quarters, thus disrupting Roland's ceiling strategy. Furthermore, it enables Ajito to overcome the speed gap by enabling him to take Roland off guard, turning the power gap between the two into an advantage for Ajito. If we are to consider Roland's failsafes, Roland would be very successful in grappling Ajito by striking his acupuncture points. However, Ajito can use the formless style to escape Roland's lock, because a lack of form 
will enable Ajito to slip out of precarious positions. Furthermore, if Ajito can react properly before Roland targets his acupuncture points, he can perform a switch to ruin Roland's timing altogether, preventing him from grappling Ajito. Even so, Roland's last resort, the Invisible Elbow, possesses viability as it's a strike thrown from outside the opponent's awareness. A blind spot that will work to delay Ajito's reflexes, which in turn serves to slow down his switch strategy and make him more vulnerable. I say this because Kuroki used something similar to overcome the very same strategy. After Ajito seemingly nullified all of Kuroki's options by breaking most of the fingers on his right arm and dislocating his left, Ajito's composer quickly evaporated after getting stabbed by Kuroki's last remaining appendage, that being his thumb. Furthermore, after Kuroki reset his left arm through centrifugal force, seemingly doing the impossible with ease, Ajito's caution increased, so much so that it stalled his attack and diverted much of his attention to Kuroki's Devil Lance, which suddenly reformed in the blink of an eye, creating a blind spot that Kuroki took advantage of in order to land a liver sot, a blow that resulted in functional decline, reducing Ajito's reflexes and widening the gap of vulnerability in Ajito's switching strategy. After all, reflexes decline relative to stamina, and as damage increases, stamina decreases. And as reflexes decrease, Ajito's period of vulnerability between switches should increase. Although Kuroki did take advantage of a small period of lag that no longer exists, the blind spot resulting from Kano's caution enabled Kuroki to overcome Ajito's strategy and resulted in a cascade that made Ajito more vulnerable, expanding the weakness of his switching strategy, which in turn expanded Kuroki's lead. Since Kuroki utilized the blind spot to do so, and the invisible elbow is a technique that uses a blind spot, Roland has the potential to create the same kind of cascade, a cascade which would further exacerbate the speed gap between the two and enable Roland to utilize his techniques in the best possible manner, enabling Roland to overcome the power gap. However, we still have to consider that Ajito's weakness has been reduced to the point that it is no longer as exploitable as it was before. So even if Ajito's reflexes are reduced by a blind spot and reduced further by a strike to a vulnerable region of the body, the same effect cannot be achieved without added effort. Furthermore, Ajito can recover when the pain from Roland's strike subsides, or he can fall back on his evolution like before in his match against Kuroki to regain the initiative. So while it is possible for Roland to overcome Ajito's strategy, it is less likely. Therefore, despite being completely outmatched on a purely technical basis, Ajito can overcome the technical difference through his strategies. So while Roland has perfected techniques that enable him to overcome vast physical differences, Ajito has perfected strategies that enable him to overcome his superiors and survive in situations where he is outclassed. But even so, despite having a far smaller chance of overcoming Ajito's strategy, Roland still possesses the very real chance of doing so. Considering how selecting a clear, definitive victor would not reflect the complexity of this matchup, nor the narrative. I will be using the 10 match system to better represent my verdict. So, out of 10 matches, I believe Ajito will win 7 matches as he possesses the strategic edge, while Roland will win 3 matches because his techniques have the potential 
to overcome Ajito's slight edge. Considering the length of both this script and this video, I congratulate y'all for making it to the end, and I thank you for investing your time in such an inconsistent channel. I made this video for a variety of reasons. To branch away from my usual content, experiment, and to simply put content on this channel. Since seeing the various perspectives that people use to justify the victor of a matchup, I came to see most of my previous content as lacking a whole lot of complexity and decisiveness, with many of them coming across as a collection of hot takes rather than well thought out opinions that best respects the story of Kengen while providing a healthy dose of accuracy. As such, I desire to abridge the videos that have come to define the channel to better suit the complexity and decisiveness that is needed. Along with the need to create accurate content, I specifically picked this matchup as it was an excuse to discuss strategies and technical skill in order to demonstrate how it influences speed, power, and endurance. Something which has sustained my interest for a long time, particularly how y'all would react to such an idea. However, I understand that such discussions will not be necessary for most matches. After all, one size doesn't fit all, and many characters in Kengen are best defined by their physical prowess or their presence within a narrative, rather than their techniques or their strategies. With that being said, I have made the mistake of trying to force characters to fit within the scope of my interest, which has resulted in inaccuracies that need to be amended. Furthermore, it has prevented me from truly analyzing characters in a way that best represents the story of Kengen. So in regards to content, my next few videos will involve fixing my mistakes. However, I cannot promise shit. I have recognized that I have a lot on my plate, and I'm simply not dedicated enough to juggle that, along with the task of growing a YouTube channel. But rest assured, I know it will not last forever, and besides, I'm a small fish in a large ocean. I am too small to fail. I know damn well I can handle the consequences of taking such a long break, because I've handled it before, and I'm more than content with doing so. Therefore, until next time, this was the cyborg whale named after Italian cheese and a dessert item. Goodbye.